Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for um, joining us for the seventh workshop in the digital teaching and learning series. This workshop is run out of the Office of the Dean of Teaching and Learning, Professor Naveen Chetty. Um, and it will be recorded and put onto the teaching and learning uh, website in the CAS College. Um, we are privileged to have today Professor Sarah Sredi, um, and she is an associate professor in the discipline of uh, higher education studies, uh, School of Education, College of Humanities at UKZN. She is an academic leader for the cluster of education and development studies and joined the university in 1999. She spent the first decade of her academic career at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine as a head of skills laboratory, where she was involved in designing and teaching uh, clinical aspects of the medical curriculum. On completion of her PhD in higher education, she moved to the discipline of higher education studies in 2014. Her research interests in higher education include um, a focus on gender and diversity, curriculum development and design, um, doctoral education, academic staff and student development, and assessing learning in the higher education context. She is also involved in two international research projects uh, with a focus on gender, religion and health, as well as in diversity of higher education curricula. Prof. Saras has graduated 10 masters and four PhDs to date and has more than 20 peer-reviewed publications. She is currently supervising 16 postgraduate students. Besides being an academic, she's also an ultra distance athlete who has successfully completed 11 Comrades Marathons and 14 Two Oceans Marathons, among many others to date. In 2016, she summited the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, and in 2018, she sum, sum, summited the base camp of Mount Everest. She is looking forward to getting to the summit of Mount Everest one day. Uh, so we're so delighted to have her here today and draw upon her expertise during this very difficult time of um, online teaching and learning. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to a Prof. Reddy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Narisha, for that uh, introduction. Um, I must say it is an honor and a privilege to be able to share my knowledge with colleagues from across the university and, and uh, across universities in the South African context, because my discipline is in higher education studies and part of that portfolio is to be able to share um, experiences of teaching and learning, assessing learning, curriculum development and design, supervising research and so on. So it is indeed a, a privilege and honor to be um, called upon to share some of my knowledge uh, today. And at the outset, I just want to say that um, my area of expertise is uh, from a pedagogical perspective and not from a technological perspective. So I'm not uh, professing to say that I have any expertise in the ICT uh, discipline. So um, just to say that my presentation has been um, designed in a way to assist um, academics to understand the concepts um, around assessing learning in terms of defining uh, what assessment is, what continuous assessment is, and the different forms of assessment, and then to draw on um, literature and uh, policies around um, what are the principles that uh, we should be following in terms of uh, designing and uh, implementing our assessment strategies, and more especially and more relevant to the context that we are currently finding ourselves in, in terms of the em emergency remote learning situation um, as a result of the uh, current pandemic that we are all facing. So having said that, um, I'm just going to um, go through a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I think will take us around about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. 
which is very theoretically um, oriented, and I'm not used to this kind of format. I, I really am struggling uh, with these Zoom um, kinds of webinar uh, presentations because I'm really, um, I, I like the interaction and I like to, to be in contact with the participants that I'm engaging in. So I, I really want to say at the outset that I, I'm also struggling uh, with this online platform. And um, you know, I'm, I'm also asking uh, big questions around um, the philosophy of teaching and learning and how is that uh, that we can you know, democratize this online space and really engage with our participants or the, the learners in, in meaningful and um, in caring ways. Because I, I find this talking to the screen problematic. That's just how I'm feeling. I'm not sure how the others are continuing with this kind of format of teaching and learning. And just to say that it is here to stay. And I guess that it's a kind of a transformation in our minds and in our pedagogical shifts that we have to um, uh, proceed with this kind of online teaching uh, context that we find ourselves in. So I'm just going to, um, I'm going to put my video off for now and I'm going to um, share my screen and present the PowerPoint presentation that I uh, compiled for the session. And then just to say at the end of that PowerPoint presentation, we will take um, the questions and answers and Narisha is going to assist me to try and organize the questions and answers in such a way that we can see how many we can get through. But also to say, <clears throat> to offer my assistance in any way. My email address is available. So if people want to communicate with me around issues of um, assessment and assessing learning, or for that matter, teaching and learning issues, please feel free to communicate with me via email whenever you wish. So I'm going to now um, share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, can you can you all hear me still? And are you able to see the the screen? If uh, participants could just raise, the, give me some indication that you are with me. Okay, thank you. I did see. It. So I am audible, and my PowerPoint presentation is visible. Yes. I'm, I'm struggling to get to the beginning of my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so uh, my first slide, just indicate if you can see it, it's it says principles and forms of continuous online assessments, a pedagogical perspective. Yes, Prof. Okay, thank you. Okay, why am I not, I'm not, um, I'm unable to move to the next slide. Okay, I'm, uh, I, I can't seem to move my screen to the next slide with my PowerPoint presentation.
All right, I, de I need some assistance here, Nirisha. I'm unable to, as soon as I share my screen, I'm unable to move my slides. Can you, can somebody assist me, please? Um, so you've started the slideshow. Yes, I, yes, I have. I've, I've okay. got, I've got it on slide share, and I see some. I've got it on slide share, but I'm struggling. Oh, okay, I've got it now. Okay. All right. Can everybody see the next slide? It says definition of assessment. Yes. All right. So let me let me proceed then. So to define assessment, uh, I've taken the definition from SACWA, uh, from the SACWA um, policy statements around assessment, which says that assessment uh, is a structured process for gathering evidence and making judgments about an individual's performance in relation to related national unit standards and qualifications. So I want you to bear in mind the levels, um, the NQF levels of the modules that you are teaching uh, and assessing. So in other words, assessments should assist in revealing how well a student has learned and what they should learn while teaching and learning ensures that they learn it. This can only happen when assessments, learning objectives and instructional strategies are closely aligned so that they reinforce one another. So I think um, last year, sometime, I was invited to do a presentation with the College of uh, uh, AES with regards to uh, the constructive alignment of learning outcomes with the teaching and learning strategies, as well as the um, assessments. So in that workshop, I paid particular attention to how do we design or construct learning outcomes um, that uh, uh, that represent the different levels of cognitive demand that we want to engage our students in. And then how do we align our teaching and learning strategies to ensure that the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are, um, that are, are meant to be achieved by those learning outcomes are covered in the teaching and learning strategies? And then how, how do we align uh, appropriate assessment methods to that, to be able to assess the extent to which the students have achieved the learning outcomes. So I think um, I made that presentation available to, to staff, but if you want uh, further um, resources around constructive alignment and how do we construct our learning outcomes in particular ways, please feel free to, to contact me directly. Then just to go back to assessment criteria. So I think assessment criteria uh, should be made very clear and transparent to our students and for the purposes of um, them understanding and for us as lecturers to understand what exactly is going to inform um, how we mark and assess our students in relation to their ability to achieve those particular uh, learning outcomes and the assessment criteria are derived directly from the learning outcomes or the objectives of the of the modules. So just to bear that in mind and to make these assessment criteria um, clear to the students, I think at the beginning of the module and to reinforce this as we are going uh, through the continuous assessment process. Electronic assessments, well, online assessments that we are all now um, moving towards. So it's about the recording, transmission, presentation, and subsequent processing of students' assessments, uh, materials, and evidence using computers and associated hardware. Now, in terms of continuous assessment, which um, in the College of Humanity, Humanities, we have made a decision that this is the route that assessment is going to take. So we've come up with a, almost a, a, a document that is guiding uh, the college with regards to how, how do we move to a continuous assessment mode. So what then is continuous assessment? So continuous assessment is conducted on a continuous basis throughout the learning experience. It is carried out at any of the given points of the total learning experience. 
uh, criteria and guidelines for the assessment of um, uh, this is derived directly from the uh, standards document, the SACWA document. And these uh, continuous or consecutive assessment opportunities include a variety of assessment methods. Um, they have predetermined weightings and include the assessment of all outcomes within the module. So to put it uh, briefly, what continuous assessment um, should do is that it should be able to test the learning outcomes uh, as stipulated in the module templates. Now, how, how we go about testing that can be, is going to be discussed in a slide later on, but just to say that, for example, if we have six learning outcomes in that module template, we need to decide um, when we are uh, formulating the continuous assessments, uh, how we are going to be able to test those learning outcomes so that by the end of the, uh, the learning period, all the learning outcomes are covered in the assessments. So we will come back to this aspect um, shortly. So continuous assessment is made up of formative and summative assessment. So I want us to get a clear understanding of what then is the definition of formative assessment. So formative assessment refers to assessment that takes place during the process of teaching and learning. And it is intended to firstly support the teaching and learning process. It is also there to provide feedback to the students on their progress. And that feedback is about uh, determining the extent to which the students have achieved or not achieved the learning outcomes for those particular modules. So please bear that in mind. So that is, it's also to identify the student's strengths and weaknesses, to assist in the planning of future learning. It is purely developmental in nature and it contributes to the student's capacity for self-evaluation. So it should give them an opportunity to reflect on their own um, performance and ability in relation to the learning outcomes. It, and it also assists us as academics with regards to a decision making uh, about the readiness of the students for the summative assessment. And please note that formative assessments do not contribute to the overall mark. So I know that some people, I, they use continuous assessment in the same uh, vein as formative assessment. So just to say that the, the clarity around or the distinguishing factor between formative and summative assessments is that formative assessments don't count for the module mark. It doesn't contribute to that mark, whereas summative assessments do. So summative assessments involve the final grading of the student learning. So, and this could be um, calculated from a range of tasks or a single major task. So this determines the overall achievement and learning success of the, of the students. And the main purpose of the summative assessment is to make a judgment of the student's performance, either a pass or a fail based on the, on the performance. So it can be defined as a measure of a student's performance or level of achievement at the end of the sequence of study. It refers to the assessment of students where the focus is on the outcome of the program or the module. So the student either passes the module or fails the module. Now in our current context, each continuous assessment method is a summative assessment and will contribute to the pass or fail of that module. And the weighting of that, I said, I have an example of how we have structured it in the College of Humanities and I will share that just now. But if you have any questions about this, um, uh, note it, and then we can discuss this further at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So examples of online uh, formative assessments are peer assessments, summaries, short uh, answer questions, quizzes, self-assessment, small tasks, MCQs, and so on. Uh, again, reiterating the point that it does not accrue for marks, marks and it's merely for developmental uh, purposes. And it can be done during the teaching and learning session or immediately after, or it can be put online, on Moodle, um, et cetera. So online summative assessments decide, um, uh, lecturers need to decide whether to administer one, two, or three 
of these assessments during the, the module. So we were given a mandate to start our online teaching from the 1st of June, and uh, we are unsure of the um, sessional dates as yet. But I, from my understanding, I think it's going to end in August. So we, we need to decide in our modules um, how frequently these continuous summative assessments will be positioned and the number of summative assessments that will make up the end of the module uh, mark to determine whether the student passes or fails that particular module. Now this can vary depending on the nature of the module. So I'm aware that in um, your college, the Agriculture, Engineering and Science College, there are a number of practical assessments that are also required. And I'm not sure how uh, the, uh, the issue of practical assessments are being uh, handled in this regard because there's no face-to-face -face and there's no contact teaching. So I'm not sure how um, lecturers are engaging in practical assessments and teaching um, right now, but that can be a discussion point later on. Uh, so coming back to the issue of um, the tasks, the continuous summative tasks, these are also uh, can be weighted differently. So for example, they can all be weighted with a 33% uh, weighting, or they can be weighted 25%, 25%, and 50%. And I do have an example of that in my own module that I teach, which I'm willing to share later on. So it's something that uh, lecturers need to decide and to have this included in the module templates and in the handbook going forward. So as I was alluding to earlier, the College of Humanities has um, discussed this and they've put together uh, two models of how online summative ass assessment weighting should take place. So model one um, uh, came up as a, as a, as a continuous, um, sorry, as an online summative assessment that is going to be testing 100% of the module learning outcomes and it can happen uh, in one assessment. So for example, at the end of that particular module, uh, one um, assessment will cover all the learning outcomes and it can be in the form of an essay or a take home test or portfolio, et cetera. So that's the first mod model, which I'm um, against really. So, th so it goes against the pedagogical uh, beliefs of continuous assessment and the purpose of continuous assessment where um, students are given an opportunity to be tested on particular learning outcomes in bite-sized uh, chunks so that we can identify strengths and weaknesses and we can determine the extent to which students have actually achieved those learning outcomes and intervene to uh, develop students and um, assist them to achieve the outcome if they haven't um, a, uh, achieved it at, by the stage of that summative assessment. Um, so having said that, then model two has been put in place where lecturers were given um, an option to weight their continuous assessments and to be able to distribute the learning outcomes for their modules in um, percentages. So the percentages uh, that are indicated in the slide uh, is uh, an equal percentage of 33 and a third percent um, covering particular learning outcomes for those modules. So the first one can be an essay covering perhaps uh, two or three of the learning outcomes. The second assessment would be in the form of a take home assignment covering the others. And then the final one can be in the form of a portfolio or open book test covering the, the balance of it. So, so I think um, this kind of model or modeling gives the lecturers or the module coordinators um, uh, flexibility in deciding how best to be able to uh, assess the extent to which students have achieved the learning outcomes and to constructively align to the learning outcomes for, for the modules. So moving on now to uh, some of the principles that we should um, have at the back of our minds when we are designing our assessment strategies. So, so, so these uh, principles come from the literature and at some policy documents 
um, that inform uh, the principles of assessing learning in a higher education uh, context. So academic, academics should continually seek to understand why they need to assess in certain ways to be effective. So it's part and parcel of the teaching and learning um, endeavor. And it is our responsibility as academics to see what would be the best uh, way to be able to assess if um, learning has taken place for a particular module. So the strategy should be in line with UKZN's assessment policy. And uh, during this emergency remote learning phase, it should be our collective responsibility to align then our traditional assessment methods, which we have been practicing for many years now with the online assessment practices. So having said that, it is giving us an opportunity to really look at our assessment practices and to see to what extent have we actually aligned them to the modules and the um, SACWA requirements of the uh, NQF levels and, and so on. So this section that I'm going to present now um, it comes from well-established general, general principles of assessments, like I said, from the literature and from particular um, policies. Now, at the outset, just to say UKZN is currently reviewing the assessment policy, and we had the DBC Teaching and Learning present um, the assessment policy and the plagiarism policy and some other uh, policies at our recent school uh, board meeting. So I'm not sure if these policies have been presented to you uh, as a college and as schools, but I think um, you should be a, a privy to, to these policies that are still uh, in the crafting stage for your input and, and so on. So we've been given that in the School of Education. So we are able to give some feedback around uh, the policies and the reviewing of the policies. So also to say that the assessment of student, uh, student learning reflects the tenet of academic integrity and should align with UKZN's code of ethics, including the rights of students as well. So the following policies apply, uh, sorry, principles apply. Uh, assessment is coherently designed as taking into account the level descriptors of the NQF, I spoke about this earlier, as an integral part of the learning process to ensure the internal alignment and coherence of a program in terms of the purpose and learning content of that program, its modules, the learning outcomes, the assessment criteria, and the assessment opportunities and strategies. So it goes back to the notion of the constructive alignment of all these things. So assessment processes are reliable, valid, transparent, and fair. And I'll come back to um, clearly outlining what we mean by that. Uh, the tasks are feasible, they're practical in relation to available financial resources, facilities, equipment, and time. Assessment should be comprised of both formative and summative assessments and is conducted on a continuous basis throughout the learning experience. And like I've been saying, what then is the purpose of continuous assessment and how do we integrate this in our assessment strategies as we're moving on to this online uh, platform and emergency remote teaching and learning and assessing learning. So assessments should include a wide range of approaches and uh, methods. And this is also um, uh, gazetted in the uh, policies uh, from SACWA and so on. Um, so we need to think about what are the uh, methods of assessing learning, uh, albeit the restriction now to the online platform. So how do we uh, innovate um, in terms of the technology to be able to give students uh, a wide range of um, assessment methods that uh, allows for, uh, and then also to filter in constructive feedback to students to be able to support their learning. Um, assessment practices are based on established good practice and contemporary research and should be aligned to the um, assessment practices and procedures required by the relevant statutory bodies or the professional bodies, uh, as well as the disciplines as, and the academic departments um, that are responsible for designing these uh, particular assessments and to ensure that quality and assurance is maintained throughout the teaching and learning and the assessment processes. 
So I think the prerequisites for assessments is something that we need to bear in mind that as assessment is a structured process in which evidence is gathered to make judgments about an individual's performance in relation to agreed and defined criteria, as well as being central to the recognition of achievement and the provision of credible certifi certification, these um, prerequisite, prerequisite principles should, um, should be um, thought about carefully before um, designing or implementing our assessment strategy. So the first one is about fairness. So fairness requires that a student is not hindered or disadvantaged when it comes to being treated equally and in an unbiased manner that appeal mechanisms are available to all students. So we know already students have the opportunity to appeal and to have their um, assessments uh, reviewed and remarked and so on. So assessment should also be uh, transparent. So transparency on which um, confidence in the assessment system rests, where it requires that all parties, which is the students, the examiners, the moderators, etc., have a good understanding of the system and have the assurance that the assessments are well planned, works in practice, and is properly regulated. In terms of reliability, reliability requires consistency in that the same judgments are made in equivalent or similar context in terms of standards, available assessment information, marks, etc. Uh, validity, so the validity of the assessment requires that the assessment processes and instrument um, assesses what they, are, what they are meant to assess with regards to the learning outcomes. So this must be uh, clearly stated, the outcomes. Uh, validity requires appropriate types of evidence by means of a suitable method of assessment. And I'm going to come back to validity, validity as well. So there should be clarity of meaning in the expression of the requirements against which student performance is measured, which is integral to student success, as well as built-in mechanisms to avoid examiner or moderator deviation, inconsistency, and errors with regards to um, marking and so on. Uh, and just to say that assessment in an outcomes-based education system emphasizes the assessment of outputs and end products that are expressed as competencies in the outcomes and assessment criteria. Coming back to the issue of validity, so the assess assessment must be valid or fit for purpose. That is, it must measure the predetermined outcomes using appropriate assessment methods. And the important aspects of validity include face validity, content validity, and construct validity. And just to give, uh, to share what each of this uh, means. So face validity is when, uh, is perceived to be fair, um, fair assessments, giving students a reasonable opportunity to show what they know and what they have mastered. So for example, any suggestion of um, bias that may be uh, seen to be detriment um, would reduce face validity. So for example, gender or ethnic bias. So it should not advantage or disadvantage any students. So the assessment should not advantage or disadvantage students. And tuition and assessment are equitable when they take, take into account the instructional context and the specific background of students in terms of their prior knowledge, cultural experience, language proficiency, cognitive style, etc. So I know that this um, current context of the online platform is uh, posing, <clears throat> or should I say is opposing face validity to a certain extent, because we know that not all students have access and students are voicing this kind of um, discontent where not everybody has been given data or not everybody has been given uh, an equal um, or equitable access to the online platform. So, so in terms of our assessment and the face validity of our assessment, that is being compromised at the moment, if I can put it that way. But we can take a, a further discussion on that point later on. In terms of content validity, so the assessment should be appropriate for the stated outcomes of the module and should cover the knowledge in terms of ideas and skills adequately. So assessment should focus on testing, mastery of important knowledge, skills and attitudes and values and not uh, you know, be 
um, peripheral in, in terms of its details. And in terms of construct valid validity, this refers to the extent to which assessment succeeds in measuring and evaluating the abilities in terms of theoretical and practical constructs that it in, intends to assess. Now, this again is um, a point of contention because of, um, should I say, the lack of uh, opportunity to engage students in terms of the practical constructs of the modules. And I'm sure that um, those of you who are involved in the practical aspects of teaching and learning and aspects from your module perspective, I'm, I'm not sure what your experiences are and how you are dealing with this issue of construct validity. So in terms of reliability, assessment should be reliable or consistent. Uh, that is, it should produce the same results when uh, students are assessed across time for the same knowledge, skills, attitudes, um, and values using a variety of methods. So it's very much like research. How is the research reliable using the different, um, yielding similar results using the different methods and so on. So um, value judgments such as passing or failing should be as objective as possible. There should be academic and administrative quality control before, during, and after the assessment. So if a student's mark uh, differs significantly depending on who marked the assessment, then the assessment is deemed not to be reliable. So it's, um, it's, it's also a matter uh, that needs to be considered now that we are going to be employing possibly markers who are going to be assisting with the large numbers of scripts that are going to be assessed online. So something to think about in that regard. And then guidance provided to examiners for marking must be transparent and defensible. So again, coming back to the assessment criteria that should be made available to um, examiners, markers, as well as the students. In terms of manageability, so assessment should be manageable. That is, it should not be too difficult or expensive to implement. And I'm not sure to what extent we are using this online platform in this way. So it should be time efficient also. So good assessment practice should be cost effective. Um, it should, be, uh, should not be carried out by expensive means if adequate information about student performance could be obtained by equally valid alternative or less expensive means. Um, quantity and the type of assessment should also allow lecturers to achieve reliable results in a reasonable period of time. So, you know, this is also an issue with regards to our sessional dates, and I'm not sure to what extent lecturers are feeling the pressure of not knowing, you know, when the semester is going to end, how are we going to manage including the continuous assessments, the different methods or uh, ways of assessing uh, considering that it's only online assessment and it's only uh, in this form that we are going to be assessing our students with the removal of the end of module exam where students are sitting in an exam hall, for example, to undertaking an exam altogether. So, so these are kinds of um, crises intervention that we need to put, we needed to put in place for this remote um, teaching and assessing that we've all had to follow. So this also relates to timely feedback to students in order to improve their learning. Now, I'm gonna come back to this issue with regards to what the College of Humanities has done um, in terms of timely feedback um, to students in order for them to improve where they have missed particular tests or what should be in place in terms of um, giving students feedback and allowing them to respond to that feedback using continuous ass assessment methods. So directness assessment should be as direct as possible. That is, it should be directly related to the real life use of the knowledge, skills, uh, and attitudes outside educational settings. So we should think about um, uh, our graduates and what they need to do uh, as they enter the, the world of work and um, how our, are we aligning our assessments with regards to what the world of work is expecting our graduates to be able to, um, to achieve. So to ensure relevance and validity, the focus should be on measuring student mastery of significant and not trivial outcomes. 
And during the planning for a new module or program, uh, tuition and assessment methods should be developed simultaneously in relation to the teaching and learning um, and meeting the learning outcomes. And we've spoken about this already in terms of the constructive alignment to see that the assessment is relevant and it's, um, and it's balanced in terms of manageability as well. In terms of authenticity, so the policy uh, is clear. It encourages authenticity where, where students are required to produce independent work, where this is um, monitored and guided by the institution's policy on plagiarism. And like I said earlier, both these policy, policies are currently under review. And authentic assessment should include um, assessment of process, practices, skills, and reflection that occur in the learning situation. And I know the issue of uh, monitoring uh, from an online perspective, the authenticity is, is an issue. So how do we monitor whether the students themselves are undertaking the assessment that we've given them, or are they sitting together with more experienced uh, students or perhaps qualified people to assist them with the assessments? And that is a, a, a matter of contention at the moment as we proceed with this online assessment um, method. So we can discuss that further. So I thought this uh, slide would be useful uh, to just assist you to think about um, some online assessment methods and aligning it with the different levels of cognitive demand as um, uh, declared by, by Bloom in Bloom's taxonomy. So in terms of the knowledge domain, so some uh, online assessment methods of choice could be multiple choice, true or false questions, matching, fill in the blank, short answer questions, uh, quizzes, et cetera. In terms of assessing comprehension, their simulations or animations or tutorials can be put online to be able to assess uh, the comprehension level. In terms of um, application, uh, you can see multiple choice questions do feature along the different levels of cognitive demand. So it's about um, designing these questions in a way that is going to uh, test higher order thinking. So um, bearing in mind that uh, multiple choice questions can do this. Um, short answer questions, essays, tutorials, etc. can be pitched at the application level also going up to um, higher levels of cognitive demand in terms of analysis, synthesis, evaluation, creative thinking, etc. How do we um, design our online assessment methods to be able to engage our students at this level of higher order thinking? Uh, also bearing in mind that we've got to align these assessment methods to the learning outcomes. And if we have constructively aligned and designed our learning outcomes in a way that um, considers these different levels of cognitive demand, then it would be easy for us to be able to um, choose the appropriate assessment method to be able to uh, assess whether or not the students have achieved these different levels of cognitive demand. Uh, so I just, borrowed the slide from a student of mine. I have a PhD student who is looking at um, the use of uh, technology uh, announced assessments at Walter Sisulu University. So he actually put together the slide uh, to be able to see uh, how lecturers in Walter Sisulu University are assessing using the different forms of assessment, assessment for learning, assessment of learning, assessment as learning, that, that um, uh, considers summative assessments, formative assessments, continuous assessments, et cetera, by engaging in technology announced assessments. And he's looking at their ability to use um, the LMS-based assessments. So with us, it's uh, Moodle. With them, they use uh, Blackboard and how they're using web-based assessments to be able to assess um, learning using the online platform. And he uh, is saying that there are various features of an online assessments that um, can be used for automated marking. There's um, a system for automated feedback in terms of text, audio, and videos. 
There's automated uh, release features and there are objective tests, true or false, multiple choice, hotspots, uh, fill in the blanks, etc. But like I said, I'm not um, uh, competent in terms of designing uh, these features and perhaps we need to include uh, somebody from ICT who will be able to assist uh, staff with regards to designing these particular uh, forms of technology announced um, assessments for the online platform. But just to say that uh, some of these tests can, we can also use the online platform to be able to assess using short answer questions, essay type questions, uh, include discussion forums and wikis. And then these uh, assessments that we do put online can be password protected assessments. They do have the ability to have uh, proctoring um, devices or a proctoring tool. I think Zoom has got a proctoring facility where to some extent the academic integrity of the assessment um, can be monitored. And again, plagiarism detection tools like um, Turnitin, et cetera. And then um, how do we uh, ensure the academic integrity of the assessment? Sometimes we do um, randomized question, question sets uh, and so on. So I thought I would include and share this information about DPs and how uh, the College of Humanities has decided to deal with the issue of DP. So the college has decided to waiver the DP. So there's no DP as there were no class marks and, form and formative assessments do not count for, for marks. So in the College of Humanities, we are, we've waivered the DP. Uh, and then just to say that the class or semester marks generated by any student before the onset of COVID-19 will be used in the calculation of students' final mark in that module. So it may be used as the first um, task of the summative assessment. So this is uh, something that, uh, that the college um, came up with after some consultation with the Dean for Teaching and Learning from the College of Humanities and uh, the academic leaders for teaching and learning. So they've come up with this kind of um, decision. And then they've also decided to, to do catch up or make up tasks instead of supplementary exams. So students who experienced challenges beyond their circumstances or well, were ill or missed some of the assessments um, due to various valid reasons, they will qualify for a catch-up or a make-up assessment. Um, and I'm not sure how this is going to be administered in terms of immediately after a particular continuous assessment or is it going to be done at the end um, of, the, of, the, of the module uh, teaching? Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure how that is going to be um, managed. And then all students with, the, uh, with marks below 50, now remember we're giving continuous assessments, so there's a, a task one, task two, task three, etc. So for any of the tasks where a student has achieved less than 50%, they will be given an option to revise and resubmit immediately after the submission of the test. And this is going to increase the marking load. And I know already that's going to be, become an issue. So um, the final mark will be calculated based on uh, the summative performance of those um, continuous assessments. And, um, but the students will be given a formative opportunity to be able to revise and resubmit if they have achieved less than 50%. And then uh, I included this because this is how we're dealing with module evaluation. So I think the quality uh, promotion, uh, QPA, they, they are currently designing um, a module evaluation for students, which is going to be online. And that questionnaire that students are going to be given online is, cu is currently under review. So they're asking questions about access to the online platform with regards to teaching, um, it's about um, the actual teaching and learning uh, procedures and the assessments and so on. So I'm not sure whether QPA has shared this document with you, but um, I think it's something to, to look at uh, as, as you are engaging with the um, online teaching process. 
this is about the moderation uh, that the College of Humanities is engaging on. So uh, guidelines for non-exit uh, non level modules. So where there's no external moderator, but um, all modules should be subject to in internal independent moderation. Uh, and this is, should be done by somebody who's not uh, teaching or hasn't been involved in the teaching of the module, but who is in the same discipline and that has the relevant uh, expertise or the knowledge. And there are two distinct as aspects of the moderation. The first part is the moderation of the assessment tasks in relation to the module content, learning outcomes and assessment criteria prior to it being finalized. And the second part is the moderation of the representative, representative sample of the assessment scripts after the summative assessments. So I'm not sure how, um, the module, how, how you in your uh, college will be dealing with the uh, with the moderation of the exit uh, non exit level modules as well as the exit level modules where the only difference here is that you're going to get an external moderator and um, the externally examined content should constitute a minimum of 50% of the overall summative assessments for the module so in conclusion, I'd just like to um, end by saying that this UKZN assessment policy is under review. I'm not sure when it's going to be passed at Senate, um, but from the previous assessment policy, um, all quality assurance principles in terms of the quality of the assessments, uh, the quality of the marking, uh, plagiarism rules and so on should be um, adhered to. Uh, in this uh, online assessment format, as we have been doing for all these years in the tra traditional assessment formats. Yeah, and once again, thank you for this opportunity for, for sharing. All right, so I know that was a lot of uh, theoretical um, concepts and principles that I went through. And like I said, I'm not very comfortable with this format of where I've got to, in a transmission mode, deliver uh, content and then at the end take um, questions and answers. But I guess uh, there are some kind of restrictions with this online format as well. So let me uh, stop there and uh, ask Narisha then to be able to facilitate the, um, the next part of it, which, you, which will entail some kind of discussion uh, with regards to questions and answers and so on. Thank you. Nirisha, if you want to come in. Uh, hi, everyone. If you have uh, any questions or you would like to uh, share, then I think we can use either the chat facility or you could just raise your hand and we will unmute your mic. Okay, Anusha. Hi, Narisha. Hi, Saurus. Hi. Hi. Um, look, my first thing is just a comment, like you've already alluded to, there was a lot of content in your presentation um, a lot of it very interesting to me, but I also need to think about it a bit more because obviously I don't have an educational background. Um, mm. So my uh, request is, would you share the presentation with us so that uh, we have time to go through and maybe contact you if we need to? Yes, sure, sure. I will. Um, I'm going to email the presentation to Nerisha and uh, she can share it. So, so I have no problems okay. with that. I, I, all right. Like I said, I know there was a lot of theory and uh, conceptual clearing around, um, you know, the concepts of assessment, which uh, people not from an educational background may be hearing this for the first time. So I do understand, uh, the, you know, the difficulty with this kind of presentation. But having said that, um, you know, it, together with your uh, teaching and learning teams, then you should be considering these principles as, you, as you're designing your assessments going forward. So I think um, I, I do understand that, uh, you know, there are difficulties with this,
but uh, yeah, I'm willing to share and I'm willing to engage further even beyond this platform. If there's any um, issues regarding assessing learning, please feel free to email me or uh, I can even have my contact details in terms of my cell phone uh, number available. I'm always willing to speak to people because it's one of my areas of um, interest. Thanks. Yeah, I would really appreciate that because I can see this is going to be a very steep learning curve for me. Um, but my question uh, pertains to your, your statement about formative assessments uh, not being used towards the calculation of, course mark, of the course mark, okay? Because um, in our um, final mark under traditional circumstances, obviously, our course mark is made up of um, formative assessments that students do during term and then the bulk of the mark, usually 75% of the mark is made up of the summative assessment, which is the exam. Okay, so that's the way it's traditionally done. So now you're saying that we should not use the summative, uh, sorry, the formative assessment mark in the calculation of our course mark, um, sorry, of our final mark. So to say it again, we should not use formative assessment marks in the calculation of our final mark for the course. Is that something that your college has decided or is it something that the university wants us to implement? Okay, so let me respond to that. Uh, thank you, Anusha, for that concern. And as I was defining um, the concepts, right, so I, I, I clarified the difference between formative assessment summative assessment and continuous assessment. Now I know from my engagement with uh, colleagues from across the university and universities that there's some confusion between continuous assessment and formative assessment. So formative assessment is purely for development purposes, like I've defined formative assessment for you and I've given you examples. So. You, you can give marks for formative assessment, but it's merely to give an indication to the student as to the extent to which they have achieved the learning outcomes that are being tested in that particular task. It's not part of the summative assessment. So in terms of the, say for example, I, I've given you that scenario, the model of three continuous assessments that make up the, the module mark. So now in the College of uh, Humanities, we, we have dropped the end of module exam. There's no end of module exam because how do you do it on the, on the online platform? You can't have everybody sit together and do that end of module exam. So we've, we've had to distribute that end of module exam and make it into continuous assessment. So for example, they, they are in a module, there are three continuous assessments, task one, is going to be 25% of the final mark. Task two is 25% of the final mark. And task three, maybe 50% of the final mark, right? So that gives you 100%. Now, each of those continuous assessments are summative. For each of those assessments to be summative, you need to have some formative opportunity prior to the summative. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So you must give students an opportunity to give them like a similar task or an opportunity to do the assessment and so that you have an idea of where the strengths and weaknesses lie to be able to give the feedback to the students to say what else needs to be done for them to achieve those particular learning outcomes. So then you, then you give them the continuous assessment. So the formative assessment is not a separate assessment. It should be included in your teaching and learning strategy. So for example, if you're having a Zoom like this, include in it some kind of activity or an online uh, a quiz immediately afterwards. So it gives the students um, an opportunity to see how much they've grasped from the teaching and learning session. Then uh, perhaps uh, a week or two into the module, you're going to give a continuous assessment uh, or task one, which is going to be going towards the final module mark. I hope, I hope you understand the difference. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'm, 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 yeah, I do think I'm understanding what you're saying. I think it's a matter of changing the way I think about this to be able to get around it. So sort of look at the major, maybe 
like three major bits in, in the module and then look at um, gearing uh, a sort of a formative assessment in each of those and then doing the summative assessment for each of those to get your final mark for the module. Okay, yeah, so, so, uh, so has your college given you some guidelines as to how you're going to be implementing your continuous assessment and whether or not you are going to have an end of module assessment? Have they, have they given you some guidelines in that regard? Well, like you all, we know there will be no end of module assessment in yeah. terms of there's no exam. So we've now uh, all had to relook really at our assessment strategy. So we've yeah. tried to develop that and we've sent it through for approval and stuff. But I think this, it's really the, the struggle to me is about getting my thinking right and to be able to gear myself towards then doing that summative assessment for, uh, for those parts of the module to actually get to that final mark and knowing that I'm actually assessing those module outcomes. Mm. So yeah, but, but thanks for that. I will obviously have to spend some time thinking about it. Okay, so just, just to, um, to say that I, I can share with you, or I can share even now, um, my uh, guidelines. So I teach a module called Researching in Higher Education, right? So, and that is only continuous assessment. There's no end of the module exam. So my continuous assessment, there's three tasks. The first task is uh, an oral presentation, um, which is weighted 25%. And so students have to do an oral presentation of a possible research problem uh, in, high, in the higher education context. And they prepare like a 10 minute or 15 minute PowerPoint presentation. And they do that um, using the oral uh, format and that is peer reviewed. So uh, as they are presenting, I get the rest of the um, peers to be able to assess, and then the mark for that come um, accounts for 25% of the module. But before they do the oral presentation as a summative assessment, I give them an opportunity in the teaching and learning encounter to be able to present either uh, to the whole class or in groups. So can you understand how the yes. formative assessment now? To develop them, yeah. To develop their, yeah. um, their expertise. And then the second task is a reading reaction. Uh, it's like a literature review. So I give them a due date uh, for the summative. And I say to them, if you submit it a week before, or uh, like we negotiate the time frame, then I mark that um, reading reaction against a grading rubric. And I give them feedback. Uh, uh, and, and, and I have the grading rubric available to them and I show them how their performance is in relation to the grading rubric, so that the assessment criteria. And I, I just give them a mark, I pitch the mark. So I say to them, if you want to improve that mark, if you want to revise and uh, resubmit, um, you, are, you, you are welcome to do so as long as you do it within a particular time frame, like uh, three days, two days or three days. So they give it back to me. They got. Uh, so I, we use the 50% or I, I use 60% as my benchmark. So anybody who achieves less than 60% in the formative assessment as an opportunity to revise and resubmit uh, against my feedback and then they submit it. So I mark it again and then I take the higher mark now. Because sometimes some students may not always um, take you to the feedback and then they resubmit nonsense, you know. So you take the higher mark and then that goes towards the end of module mark. So have you, you see how I'm using the formative together with the summative continuous assessment in that regard. And then the yes, final one. Okay. So the final one, which is weighted 50%, I don't give them that opportunity of revising and resubmitting because they have two formative opportunities already. So in the third, in the third assignment, which is weighted 50%, I mark that and then that also goes directly to the external moderator, because these are terminal modules that I'm teaching. Okay, but the other 50%, you, you've given them an opportunity to revise and, and resubmit. So that is the formative of opportunity that I'm giving. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, the, that is, uh, <laughs> that is a, a good example. Um, the other thing that you did mention is your, your presentation that you did on constructive alignment for our college, which unfortunately I didn't attend. Would you uh, also share that with us? 
Okay, not a problem. I'll email that to, to Nerisha as well. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Yes, we do. Uh, Bongi wants to know, how can we ensure students do not plagiarize in our online assessment? Okay, so the issue of plagiarism, um, we still got to turn it in, right? So a turn it in is not um, really a, a, a plagiarism tool. It's, it is a similarity index. It gives us a similarity index. So it cautions us about um, uh, how much of the essay or, you know, the assignment as is similar to some other uh, electronic um, resource. So I think students have, have to put their assignments or their submissions through Turnitin, and then we've got to look at the report and see to what extent is there similarity, because some words and some phrases are, are very common. So it is up to the assessor or the, the lecturer to be able to see what exactly has been um, plagiarized in terms of uh, word for word or sentences or paragraphs that have been copied word for word without referencing. So that is the important thing to see uh, to what extent has the student acknowledged or referenced the source. Um, many, my, from my own experience, I don't even need to turn it in. I can, as I'm marking an essay or an assignment, I immediately detect when the tone of the, the writing changes. And I, all I do is I take that paragraph and I put it into Google or Google Scholar and it gives me the, 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 the source. And I think our plagiarism policy is very clear on, on what needs to be done when students are caught plagiarizing. So there is a database of offenders. There's a kind of a um, flow diagram of uh, proceedings in terms of disciplinary action and counseling of the student and so on. You know, first time offenders, severity of the offense and so on. So we need to be able to look at the plagiarism policy uh, to be able to see what, what needs to be done in, in terms of a protocol. How, how do we react and respond uh, when a student plagiarizes? But just to say, with, I, with my students, what I do is, if it's the first assignment that they are submitting, right? And as I'm, as I'm going through the assignment, I pick up the, the areas of, that are uh, plagiarized. So I, I put on, I do my, my marking using track changes and comments. So I put the first comment. I say, um, this has been plagiarized, uh, this section has been plagiarized, and I even put in the, the source because I'm able to, to identify the source where the student has copied that. And then I go further down, I say the second incident. So in the second incident, I say to them, I'm, I'm now not going to mark any further. I'm giving you an opportunity to revise and resubmit this without you uh, copying. And in the email communication, I ask um, about the academic uh, writing and if they are understanding what needs to be done in terms of referencing. So it's, uh, it's serving two purposes. It's showing them that I've, I've been alerted to the fact that there's some plagiarism, but I'm also trying to understand what are the possible reasons for the plagiarism. Is it that they don't know uh, the academic writing, the art and craft, or they haven't acquired the art and craft of academic writing? Is it that they are not familiar with the referencing style? So I'm giving the, them an opportunity to engage with me to see, to, to get deeper into the, pro, into the problem. If they do it again, they, they are allowed to revise and resubmit. If they do it again, and I find the plagiarism even in the first instance, they get zero for that submission. And then the, according to the policy, you've got to report the student because there is a database of offenders. So each college should have a database and, uh, you know, and then there's, there's steps to be followed in terms of undergraduate students. I don't teach undergraduate students, so I'm talking from a postgraduate perspective um, uh, in terms of the module teaching that I do for um, the honors and master's level. So this is how I deal with it in, in, from that perspective. But the plagiarism with regards to dissertation and uh, thesis writing as also the policy is quite clear on what steps need to be taken with regards to um, the college, de sorry, the um, uh, academic leader for research, and then it goes to the um, college dean for research, and uh, and so on. There needs to be a committee that's constituted. 
to deal with the with the with the plagiarism. But like I said, it's about the the extent of the plagiarism. Um, first time offenders, uh, second time offenders, and undergraduate students are uh, treated slightly different from postgraduate students, etc. I hope I've been able to address that issue. Thanks. <coughs> Alfred wants to know, um, he says, one of the challenges we are having with formative assessment is that students do not feel compelled to do the quizzes. Uh, recently, he gave a test and uh, only 23 out of the 69 students attempted it. So how do you deal with this kind of situation? Uh, and then I think the other part of it was, um, so the moment you make the quiz or test count towards the final assessment, do we still consider it formative? Okay, thanks. So, uh, so I, I think I, I'll address the, the second part of the question first, because I've covered that. So if the, if the marks are going towards the module mark, then it's not a formative assessment, it's, it becomes a summative assessment. So formative is only for development purposes, only for um, trying to give feedback with regards to the extent to which the students have achieved the learning outcomes. So, so I hope that um, that is clear, made clear. With regards to um, motivation or trying to motivate the students to undertake the formative assessments, I do hear a lot of colleagues say that if we putting tests out there and it's not going for marks, students don't want to attempt it. But if you make it you know, part and parcel of the teaching strategy. So for example, if you, um, some aspect of the learning outcomes are not covered in, in the teaching, but are covered in the assessment, in that formative assessment, they'll have no choice but to do it because for them to understand, uh, you know, have I uh, completely understood uh, the learning outcomes for this particular um, uh, topic? Uh, I, I need to be able to engage with the teaching and learning activity as well as the formative assessment, if you understand what I'm saying. So, so you, you need to be strategic in terms of how you are designing your teaching and learning strategy. You, 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 you're teaching a certain aspect of that uh, particular topic, and then you using the formative assessment to cover some of the other outcomes that are required for that particular topic. So, so you, you've got to negotiate that balance. So, so the formative assessment can be in the form of an activity, a group activity, um, or self-assessment activity, or a peer assessment activity, which is covering aspects that you haven't covered in the PowerPoint presentation or in your, um, in your delivery. So, so I, I hope you know, you, you can understand what I'm saying. That's how I do it. I give activities uh, and the activities are directly related to the formative aspect, which is constructively aligned to the learning outcomes of the modules that I'm teaching. So I'm, I'm killing two birds with the same stone. Thanks. Uh, Karen, <laughs> comment. Um, she says, I am doing quizzes as formative assessment but I make them count some two or three percent towards the final. They are allowed to retake the quiz to improve their score. Um, I work from um, question banks, so they are not required. Okay, so, so, so I said formative assessments can be um, mark-based. So you're giving feedback um, together with the mark. And if there's an opportunity for improving the mark and the the improved mark goes as the summative, then I think you are principally, you, 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 the formative assessment is not really going to, the first assessment is not going towards the mark, but the second. The, so it is a form of formative assessment. So it's not directly going towards the end of module mark because they're given an opportunity to improve the mark. So the second opportunity is the summative opportunity. The first opportunity of the quiz is then the formative opportunity. I think that that's covered. Thanks. Um, Bong, Bong here just wants some clarity. She says formative does not count towards final mark. If a yes. quiz or test counts, then it's continuous assessment. I yes. hope this is correct. Yes. 
if the mark is going towards a module mark, whatever percentage it is, whether it's 10% or 5%, if it's going towards the final mark, then it is a summative assessment. Uh, Prof, I just wanted to know, um, you know, you mentioned that your student was working on the different forms of technology enhanced assessment. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd be able to share some of the names of those tools, like the uh, online proctoring tools and things with us. So, uh, you, you see, Zoom has got a proctoring facility, but like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not an ICT expert, so I don't know how the, I don't even know how the proctoring tool uh, works. But as my student, he's just um, completed his uh, research proposal, he's defended the proposal. So as he is now um, going into the field to do the field work, and he's going to have an understanding of how lecturers at Walter Sisulu University use the, these techno technology announced assessments, I then will be able to see what the different forms are and so on. As soon as I'm able to do that and he shares the literature review chapter or something, I, I can put together something and, uh, you know, possibly um, a one page concept note based on, on, on his study and be able to share that with you. Is that okay? Yes, thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Oh, Bongi just says that it's difficult to detect plagiarism in science modules because most assessments are based on calculations. Yeah, I think um, we, need, we need to, uh, you know, maybe invest in some software um, to meet these specific needs uh, of the college. Uh, and so like look into that. And if anyone has any ideas of um, tools that we can use, maybe they can share it on the discussion um, the panel here. Yeah, so thank, thank you for that, Bongi. I, I really see, um, you know, the struggle. In fact, with our colleagues um, in the School of Education with maths and so on. So, so how do you know, you, like you've given um, an online assessment that requires, um, you know, some problem solving. So they've, they've got to uh, write out uh, some steps. Now, how do you know that uh, they are the ones that are, are doing that or they're getting somebody else to um, answer for them, or they've copied it directly from somewhere. How, how, how do you know that? It's, it's so difficult to be able to assess, you know, the, uh, the academic integrity of the assessment process in, in that regard. I, I really hear your struggle. But I think um, from a philosophical perspective, uh, as we engage with our students and as we engage in the teaching and learning, uh, these kinds of um, trust, um, and uh, trust issues have to be um, raised, you know, as you, as you are engaging with the students. And this kind of format now with the Zoom teaching and WhatsApp teaching, it makes that, uh, that level of care uh, so much more difficult. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but even here, <laughs> I find it so difficult to talk to my laptop. I can see pictures and whatever. But the kind of uh, rapport that you build with your students uh, is not there. It, it, there's some kind of a, a lack because with me uh, and my 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 students, I form a kind of a, a trust relationship where where they they don't want to actually breach the trust and 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 that's you know it it, it wins or it's kind of um, solving that problem of the academic integrity issue because they don't want to copy or you know go uh, or breach our trust in any way. Um, they want to do the work themselves because they see the, the benefit of the assessments and they see that the assessment is part and parcel of the teaching and learning uh, endeavor. And it's about them being able to achieve the learning outcomes that are demonstrated in their performance in the test that is uh, the, mo the priority, should I say. So it's, it's in your um, teaching and learning interactions, it's important to, to raise these issues. And, and, and to develop this kind of um, 
motivation in your students for them to be able to, to undertake the assessments for that particular purpose. Uh, I hope, uh, well, I wish you well in doing that. It's easier said than done, and especially with large classes, I can imagine uh, the difficulty in that situation, but that's the best I can respond to you for now. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, there aren't any other hands raised or comments or questions that I can see. So if you would just like to do a quick summary and then we can, we can conclude. All right, so once again, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity for sharing. And like I said, I'm passionate about this area of uh, assessing learning in the higher education context. So, um, you know, any assistance that I can uh, provide, please feel free to contact me either on my email or on my cell. I will give, I will share this presentation now with the Nerisha, I'll email it to her and she'll make it available to you. But just to say uh, in summary, um, and, and you guys are not educationalists, so you know these terms and these concepts are difficult. Um, but as you are proceeding in this kind of online uh, teaching and learning format and getting used to um, adopting some of these principles, uh, I wish you well. Um, and like I said, some of these principles are very, um, uh, it's about engaging the students in terms of fairness, validity, reliability of the assessment and, and, and so on. So it's something that we need to be able to communicate with our students and to be able to look at it from their perspective as well, because it is a difficult and challenging time for all of us uh, during this pandemic. Um, yeah, and just to say, um, I, I, wish, I, I wish you all the best in your online teaching and learning and assessment, but I also want to extend um, some words of uh, safety and, uh, and care as you, as you proceed through this, uh, this pandemic as well. And I wish you and your families strength and um, courage as we all have to live through this pandemic uh, together. And hopefully we will be um, you know, saved from this and we can all meet face to face in other fora. Um, as we uh, interact uh, as a university. So once again, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, Narisha, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much, Paul. It was very valuable. Uh, I think we can all agree with that. Um, and we wish you well as well, and um, you know, health and strength to you and the family, um, and to all our colleagues. Um, I just want to... Um, say that this presentation will be available on the ERT sandbox um, module, which is on Moodle. And uh, we will also put the recording um, on the uh, CAS teaching and learning website. So thank you all for attending. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, we will see you again. Please uh, keep looking uh, out for um, further uh, teaching and learning um, workshops, uh, we will mail those uh, to you as uh, they arise. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. I will email you now, Nerisha. Thank you. Bye.